Thank you, Joe. Uh, it's a great occasion to celebrate a historic form to which everyone here has contributed to like a kind of wedding. I'm only sorry that Tom and Ali couldn't be with us this evening. He had to fly to Croatia this afternoon. His leadership has been and remains essential. Uh, apart from the libel bar, I don't know whether there's anyone from the libel bar here, but apart from the libel bar, most people agree that English defamation law was impressively used to form to strike a fair balance between the right to free speech and the right to protect good reputation. Uh, libel law, criminal and civil, was created by the medieval ecclesiastical courts and the Court of Star Chamber and the Common Law Courts. Parliament left it largely to the judges, and in the whole of the 20th century, Parliament is to be only twice, in 1952 and 1996, with minimal reforms to tackle problems deeply or systematically. Um, I shall count the bit that explains what was wrong with that law, because I think you all know that. So bad was it that President Obama approved uh, legislation preventing English private judgments from being enforced in the land of the First Amendment. Uh, I became convinced by the Libel Reform Campaign and by my professional experience that the time was right, over right, for reform. I designed a bill to be introduced immediately after the general election. I was hugely helped by two renowned legal experts, Sir Brian Neal, who is with us this evening, and Heather Rogers QC, a, 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 a gifted freelance parliamentary counsel, Stephanie Grundy. I was also hugely helped by an advisory group that included English Pen, the Nippon Sensory, Sense About Science, and the in-house lawyers from Times, The Guardian, and the BBC. Uh, Joe Dawson, parliamentary legal officer in my political office, has worked with me on the project throughout and should be given a large part of the credit for our success. As Joe has said, the centrepiece is the new public interest defence, but the reform of the other defences and the prevention of trivial cases of libel and tourism are also important. I hope the legal profession and courts will interpret the new law in a way that promotes its important purposes. There is still much to be achieved, and I've called my remarks after Ian Force's essay, Two Cheers for Free Speech, because I count it third. We await the crucially important new procedural and cost rules being fashioned by the judiciary under the leadership of the master of the role of Lord Dyson. They are crucial if the act is to result in a level of playing field between the weak and the powerful, the reduction of costs and unnecessary litigation, active case management, alternative dispute resolution, the use of county courts, as well as the high court, and so on. And as Joe said, we also await the draft regulation governing publication via the internet. Norman Valley decided at an early stage that when Sir Brian Leveson's report was published, it should not be allowed like a tsunami to overwhelm and drown the libel. Tom Valley almost failed. The bill was taken hostage by well meaning parliamentary colleagues, influenced by the well heeled by the well heeled and powerful act on off campaign. They amended the bill with amendments that were punitive and unfair and incompatible with the right to free speech protected by the Human Rights Act and the Convention. The Prime Minister was not bluffy when he refused to send the bill to the Commons unless those amendments were removed. They were indeed removed following a series of amendments to two other bills cobbled together by politicians from the three parties and hacked off. I believe in an effective system of self-regulation of the press by an independent body able and willing to give effective benefit and enforce professional standards by editors and journalists. But the new statutory scheme is an example of legislative overkill, using a steamroller to crack a nut. Yeah. Yeah. 
the use of exemplary damages to punish publishers who don't join the scheme or abide by its rulings is unprecedented in the free world and sets a terrible example. The scheme is one-sided and unbalanced. It would be unacceptable in regulating the legal or the medical professions, and it's equally unacceptable in regulating the professional journalism but it's already subject to many criminal and civil laws and sanctions. If they're guilty of the gross abuses identified by Leveson, there are plenty of laws to punish them and ensure their victims have effective remedies. And I, I doubt whether the Hancock scheme will pass muster under the Human Rights Act and the Convention. So that's one of the reasons why I can't give three cheers. Another pressing problem is the refusal by the Northern Ireland government to apply the reforms there. If that refusal continues, it will completely scupper the reforms because it will mean we will have nothing to celebrate. It will mean that publishers, NGOs, citizen critics, the media will all risk having to defend themselves under the old common law system in Northern Ireland, even though the Defamation Act was passed to bring our legal system into line with the Human Rights Commission. I understand that a prominent libel practitioner, Mr. Paul Tweed, has been advertising for clients and is hoping to make Belfast the libel power. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to debate this in the House of Lords at 5 o'clock-ish on the 27th of June, Thursday, in the Grand Chamber. And I very much hope that everybody here will put pressure on the government to put pressure on the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, whose name may escape you, so that she can put pressure on the Sinn Féin and DUP coalition to implement the defamation law in Northern Ireland, because otherwise it destroys three years' work. And so I very much hope that the government and the Assembly will soon agree to give effect to these much needed reforms. And that will avoid the need for the Secretary of State to use her powers under the Northern Ireland Act to require this to be done to securely reform with Article 10 of the Convention. See, under our non-federal system, that's the only way you can do it. In America, they have a federal system, so the Supreme Court can govern the country. We don't have that situation here. So finally, I hope and believe we've achieved balanced reforms that may become models across the common law world. That's why this event is a well-deserved celebration in which I'm privileged to take part. Thank you very much. And don't forget more.